Thank you, choir, and Ken, and Penny, and Robin. That was beautiful. Uh, we're so blessed, as Pastor Doug mentioned, to have such a great music program here. We've been talking unofficially this year that our slogan is more in 24, and we're already seeing that happen in several ways. Uh, we're praying for more of Jesus, more of his spirit, more of his power, more of him, less of us. A uh, couple announcements we've already mentioned about our prayer ministries. Uh, David and Missy are providing great leadership in that, and that's a wonderful thing that's going to be happening. Also on Tuesdays, beginning March the 5th, in here, we'll have a time of prayer from 11.30 to 12.30. You can come and go. We'll have a short devotion to kick it off, and then we're just going to pray, praying for revival and, and reformation. A lot of times we experience maybe revival, but unless reformation happens, and that happens through discipleship, there won't be a long-lasting change. So we're going to be praying for revival and reformation. And so you put that on your calendar. Even if you're at work and can't be here, pray during your lunch hour on that day for revival and reformation. And, and also, uh, Missy Evans has uh, accepted a new position with the Global Methodist Church here in North Alabama. She is the administrative assistant for our president pro temp. Let's give Missy a round of applause. What a great opportunity. God's church is growing. He's blessing. And um, you pray for me that I'll be a servant when she gets directions to tell me what to do. <laughs> uh, uh. Today we began a, a new series in questions, important questions. I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. A lot of times when pastors preach about questions, the way it works is there'll be surveys and the folks will write down their questions and then those questions will be taken up and you, you, you formulate a, a series, six, seven, whatever messages about the most frequently asked questions. Questions that you would ask, you want to hear preached about. We're, we're, going to, we're going to look at it a little differently. Nothing wrong with that. That's very important, very powerful, because it eventually will get back to God's Word, won't it? But we're going to look this, in this series leading up to Easter Sunday, questions that God asks, questions that we find in the Word of God. We're going to begin today with Genesis chapter 3, the very first question that God asked. Let's read about it in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. I'm reading from the New International Version. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you'll die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? The Lord called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. Lord, thank you for letting us read and Lord, thank you for giving an anointing so that we can hear what the Spirit is saying. Lord, let me walk in that anointing so we'll know exactly what to say. I pray for, Lord, your help. Thank you for promising to answer and giving wisdom when we need it. Lord, cover me with your power so that I will hear what you want me to hear and say what you want me to say this hour. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
This week I did an informal poll in the office and I, I asked uh, some of the staff, what do you think is the most popular game that kids play? Now think about that for just a second. I, th I think it transcends across languages, across cultures, geography. We, we came to this conclusion, one of, if not the most popular game that kids play is hide and seek. We've all played hide and seek. We see here the scripture, the very first hide and seek. Let's talk about it for a little bit this morning. I believe that God's intent in the beginning when he created man and woman was to have a love relationship with human beings. And in order to have a, a love relationship, in order for there to, to be love, there has to be freedom. So God gave Adam and Eve freedom of choice. And they chose wrong. And we see in chapter 3, the, we, we, we call it in, in the church the fall, that Adam and Eve disobeyed and sin entered in because of the fall. And now, I, I want to focus our uh, time this morning on verses 8 through 10, where after they realized they were naked, they hid. And in and, and verse 9, God came to them. God came walking and, and said, where are you? So our question this morning that I would like the Holy Spirit to help us to deal with, and that is, where are you? Let's apply it to our own lives this morning. Let's not just think about what happened to Adam and Eve. Let's look at our condition. Let's look at where we are. Where are you? And I want to ask four questions about that question, and then we'll be done. The, the first question is, what questions did God not ask when he came that day in the cool of the day? What did he not ask? He, he didn't ask them, have you been good? And when we were kids and we would go sit on Santa's lap, you remember what Santa would say? Have you been a good little girl? Have you been a good little boy? Well, God doesn't ask that question when he comes to Adam and Eve. They knew and he knew the answer if he had asked that. The Bible, very clear. There's none righteous, no, not one. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We've each gone our own way. We've all sinned. We've fallen short. The wages of sin is death. So God didn't ask Adam and Eve that question. Have you been good? He didn't ask them why. He didn't ask them, why did you do that? I think as earthly parents, lots of times we'll ask our kids, why? What were you thinking? God didn't ask why. We get so focused on the why questions. We get so fascinated with the whys that if we had all of our why questions answered, that knowledge would not give us help to be free and to be living in the light. So God didn't say why. God didn't say, what am I going to do now with you? See, God didn't have to come up with another plan. God's plan was not to annihilate and recreate all new. God's plan was to come to Adam and Eve and ask, where are you? Now let's deal with it. So God's not interested in uh, what we're going to do now. Let me give you a little secret. No, it's not really a secret. Ephesians 1 verse 4. Maybe you've not read it lately. It says that God chose you to be in him before the creation of the world, that we might be holy and blameless before him. Wow, isn't that, isn't that beautiful? Before, the, before this happened, before God came to Adam and Eve and said, where are you? God already knew. He already had a plan. So he didn't have to say, what am I going to do now? He didn't have to try and come up with plan B. There is no plan B. And he didn't say, how dare you? Can't believe it. God didn't walk away in anger. God came in love. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 tells us that God showed his love to us while we were still sinners Christ came and died for us oh we're, we're to be we're to be believers who worship passionately can't you get excited about that while we were 
dead in our trespasses and sins, when our mind was darkened because of sin, God came to us and the cross proves that he has a plan and he's ready to accept us. Aren't you thankful for that? Second question I want to look at this morning. What does this tell us about God? But it, first of all, it tells us that God is our friend. Oh, I'm ex- aren't you excited about it? God is your friend. God is not our enemy. God is still our friend even though we've rebelled and walked away from him. Uh, he comes to us. He's for us. I think I heard my dad say for the first time many years ago when I was a little boy, uh, there's, there's been an election. God has voted for you. The devil has voted against you. It's how you vote is going to determine how the election turns out. God has voted for you. He's voted for us. Uh, he's come to us. We see also that he knows the worst about us. He may be grieved, but he's not shocked. He knows all about us. When our kids were small, about three and a half and five, Daniel's the oldest and Rebecca's the youngest. They're 14 months apart. I I won't ever forget, we were at the dinner table one evening uh, at our our first church, the Asbury Church out from Albertville. And Susan and I were giving parental advice. We were trying to teach our kids and we got around to talking about God sees everything. He knows everything. You You can't fool God. He's able to know all about us and sees everything. And Rebecca, the three and a half year old, she said, I'm just going to get under the table. <laughs> see, and, and her three and a half year old mind, if I get under that table, he can't see me. But God sees under the table, doesn't he? And wherever we're hiding, he sees us. So he, he doesn't have to ask that question because he already knows the worst about us. And he's still seeking. Isn't that marvelous? And he's forgiving. His nature's forgiving. He's he's ready to accept us. He's ready to change us and give us a new heart and a new spirit. In Luke chapter 15, there's the, the parable. There's actually three parables in one about how much God loves us. Jesus began by talking about the shepherd who has a hundred sheep. You know the story. What, what would the good shepherd do if he just lost one of those hundred? He would go looking for the lost lamb. 99% is pretty good in anybody's book, isn't it? but not in God's book. He's after the one lost lamb. He's forgiving. He told the story about the woman who had 10 silver coins and she lost one. And she turned the house upside down until she found that one coin. It was lost. That's teaching us about the nature of God's love, how he wants to forgive our sins and our trespasses. And then he told the parable of the prodigal son. The prodigal son just left and went on his own way and squandered everything and rebelliousness. But if you reread that parable, and, and I did this week, the father, you know what he's doing? He's looking. I can just imagine the father sitting on his front porch in a rocking chair. He's looking every day. He's waiting. He's watching. He's hoping. And then that day he saw his son coming down that dusty trail. And you know what the father did? You've read it, haven't you? He got up and he ran to the son. He didn't say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll wait and see if he's changed. He didn't say, I'll, I'll, I'll forgive him, but I'm not going to forget it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accept him on conditions if he measures up. No, he ran to the prodigal son. He put his arms around him. He hugged him and he kissed him because that's the kind of God we have. He's our friend. He knows the worst about us and he wants to forgive us. He's ready to come to us. Let's look at the third question. How do we respond to God's question? When God says, where are you? Where are you? Sometimes we will say, well, everybody's doing it. What do you expect, preacher? I'm just human. Oh, I wish I had a dollar for every time I've heard that. Now, there's a grain of truth in that, but, but when, you're, when you're listening to God speak to you, don't dare say, well, everybody's doing it. That kind of logic is like, kind of like doing 65 miles per hour in a 55-mile-per-hour zone. 
And, and you say, well, everybody's doing it. The logic is if, if we all do it, then nobody's guilty. But that doesn't apply to our own hearts. Sometimes we say, well, I'm okay. I'm, I'm not that bad. I'm better than most. That's, that's kind of like saying, well, 65 miles per hour is better than 90 miles per hour, and I'm not doing 90, so I'm okay. I'm pretty good. Sometimes we'll, we'll say, well, I know that one day I've got to get my life straight. One day I'll come out from hiding. I'll come out from the trees one day, but not right now. Let me just remind all of us, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Right now, if you're hiding and you know God is calling, where are you? Please don't wait. You will never have a better opportunity than right now to come out from hiding and let, let the Lord help you to, to be redeemed and walk in the light, receive his glory. We carry something special with us. And God wants us to come out of darkness, out of hiding and walk in that light. So whatever venue we walk into, there's a presence that goes with us. And people will know, people will know that God's with us. Sometimes we pretend we don't hear God speaking or we'll ignore his voice totally. We'll, 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 we'll pretend, but you, you cannot. As long as you're alive, I don't believe you're going to quit hearing that knock. Because he's saying this morning, I'm standing at your door, I'm knocking. If you'll just open the door, I'll come in. Uh, he's speaking. Now, the Bible's very clear. For somebody who's hiding, for somebody who's lost, they, they, they don't hear everything God's got to say. 2 Corinthians 4 4 says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers and they cannot see the light. They can't see the light of glory of the gospel. Can't. If you hear him calling, don't put him off. You may be saying, well, they're, they're, I listen to a lot of other voices. There, there are a lot of other philosophies. Don't listen to the wrong voice. Adam and Eve listened to the wrong voice. They started looking at the wrong thing that led to desire. They took the wrong thing. They disobeyed and they lost their position with God. So let's not ignore him when he says, where are you? The last question, where do we like to hide? Let me give you four thoughts and then we'll be done. In our busyness, we're good at hiding in our just being busy, 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 busy. God doesn't want you to be like a hamster just walking in circles. God has a plan, a purpose. Psalm 39, verse 4, ought to slow us down a little bit this morning. Listen. Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. Lord, show us this morning how important today is and how you want us to just take our hands off. Be still. The psalmist said, be still and know that I'm God. We couldn't be in a better place than right now just to be still. Just to not be too busy to listen. I read a devotion sometime back from, it was written by Allie Worthington. She writes for Proverbs 31 Ministries. It was a devotion about just how too busy she had become. In her good thing, good work, all the good things she just said, I got crazy busy. And she said she was in a crowded airport one day and she realized she had left her cell phone in the shuttle, the hotel shuttle that brought her to the airport. So in line, she, she asked the couple in front of her if she could borrow their phone in order to call her phone. She was hoping that the shuttle driver would answer her phone and he would bring it back to her. So she got their phone and she... She rang her number, and as she was waiting, she said, my blouse started to ring. And she had, in her busyness, in her just being overwhelmed with life, she had forgotten that she had tucked her phone in her blouse. 
You've seen women put dollar bills or whatever and they're down in their blouse. She had put her phone in her blouse. She said, you can believe I did not look at anybody on that airplane, on that flight home, because I was so embarrassed. <laughs> Just slow down. Get off the treadmill. Let God speak. Don't be too busy to listen to God call. Pleasures, that's another way that we hide. There are lustful pleasures, things that are of the flesh, sinful, they're wrong. They're legitimate pleasures. Nothing wrong with them. Unless we become preoccupied with them and we let them take God's place. So don't get consumed in trying to counteract our hiding by just doing lots of things, fun things. The third way that we can hide is in addictions. What are you addicted to? I'm not talking just about alcohol or gambling or drugs, nicotine or caffeine. There are a lot of other things we can be addicted to. We can be addicted to, to just work. We can be addicted to shopping. We can be addicted to eating. There are all kinds of things we can be addicted to. We can be addicted to the internet. We can be addicted to our smartphone. We can be addicted to video games. On and on and on we go. See, the problem is not in the thing necessarily. It's in our addiction to the thing. Let's not hide in our addictions. The word addiction in Latin is addictus, which means basically surrendering to the gods. When we're addicted to something, it may not be harmful if it's in its right position, but it becomes harmful if we surrender to that God and it becomes an idol. It can be like this in our lives. It, it, was the, it was the best thing until it became the worst thing. Addictions are like that. Oh, so good until it becomes our death sentence. We should not be addicted to anything other than the Lord Jesus. We are to worship him passionately, serve him with all of our heart. The last thing, like Jesus, when he turned the water into wine, they said, well, you you saved the best for last. I've saved the best one for last. We can become addicted at church. We can be addicted to just sitting in our pews. We can be addicted to just standing behind the pulpit. We can be addicted to just being in our class. We can be addicted to just being on the right committees but we're hiding. The writer of Hebrews says, chapter two, how will we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? How do we escape? It can be through bad things. It can be through something good if we're just, if we're just escaping. One day the Bible says all escape routes are going to be closed. It's called the day of the Lord in the Bible. It's when he brings the curtain down. I pray that none of us are hiding on that day because salvation is God's attempt to make a real person, a real man, a real woman out of you and me. And if we're hiding, if we're pretending, if we're afraid, if we're in alienation, if we're in shame, if we're in guilt, we will not come to the light and we will not receive the pardon, the forgiveness and the regeneration and the hope that only God can give us. You and I live in a broken world. But not only do we live in a broken world, we are born broken. The brokenness is not just out there. The brokenness is in here. And we must remember that. Because Adam and Eve sinned ever since then, everyone who has been born other than the perfect one, the Lord Jesus, we have been broken because of a sinful nature. And we hide. It's just natural to hide because of our 
shame and our guilt and our alienation. In Adam, 1 Corinthians 15 says, in Adam, we all die. But in, in Jesus Christ, we all live. We're not just victims of brokenness. If we're hiding, we're perpetrators in the brokenness. God wants to make something of us to call us to come out into the light, to be clothed in his righteousness. Let's pray together. After a time of prayer, we'll sing our last song. But right now, before we sing our closing song, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will just keep speaking. I'm about done with what he's given me to say. But he's speaking. Where are you? Where are you this morning? Are you hiding? Have you been too busy? Have you put too many things ahead of him? Are you too wrapped up in pleasure to where it's become addictive, an idol? Is there an addiction in your life? Jesus came to set the captives free. He comes to deliver us from the power of the enemy. We don't have to wait to heaven to be set free. Let the Holy Spirit do what he can do and what only he can do. Maybe you've just had a relationship with the church and you've been hiding from him. Lord, today we come out of hiding. We accept your forgiveness and your cleansing power. And we thank you that in you, we become holy and blameless. Yeah. So guide us and direct us. Lord, let us have more of you in 24. Lord, more of your healing power. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.